I'm author and critic David Agronoff. I'm a horror and science fiction author, critic, and researcher. In this podcast, I wanted to provide in-depth interviews and panel discussions with everyone from New York Times bestselling authors to researchers, musicians, and anyone I find interesting. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. I am super stoked to have my special guest here today. Before I introduce him, of course, I have to do a little bit of props for my own work. Uh, The Last Night to Kill Nazis. If you hate Nazis but like vampires, I've got the novel for you. It's a, a vampire novel set on the last day of World War II, and it's available nationwide here in the United States at Barnes and Nobles. And, um, uh, it's out there. You can get it anywhere, though, from Clash Books. So uh, just one little um, prop for, for my latest book. Um, and I got another one coming in March, but details are coming soon. Uh, but we're here to talk about a different book. We're here to talk about um, Mike Carey's uh, latest book under the uh, name M.R. Carey, uh, which we'll talk about that transition, I'm sure, in a little bit. Um, but the, Mike's new book, Infinity Gate, is absolutely one of the best reads I've had, not just of the year, but it's one of the best science fiction books I've read in a long time. And so we're going to talk about Infinity Gate. But welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Mike Carey, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank, thanks for inviting me on. Happy to be here. Yeah, um, I have read your work since before you were a novelist. I've read your work in comics. I'm a giant Hellblazer fan, so that's where I first discovered your work from and writing okay. the line. Um, did you start as a comic reader, or were you always were were you a prose guy from the beginning? What's your origins with genre? Well, with, with comics, that deep. <laughs> with comics, um, I mean, I, I I learned to read from comics when I was about three years old. Um, there was a British comic called Wham with an exclamation point after it, um, which was the brainchild of two um, incredible British talents, um, Leo Baxendale and Ken Reed. Uh, they'd become disillusioned with DC Thompson, um, no connection to the American DC, it's a Scottish publishing firm, uh, and moved to a, a different publisher, Fleetway IPC. And they were given like uh, free reign to do their own stuff. And at the age of three, I picked this this comic up and it just blew my mind. I, I can sort of remember spelling out the words on my mother's knee, um, literally. Um, so I could spell words like arg with three R's um, at, at, at a very young age. And, and it's kind of started a lifelong love affair. Um, when I was eight, um, my brother, my older brother gave me a Fantastic Four annual um and it was with the, it's the one where um reed is trapped in the negative zone and they have to uh, find someone to to free him and they choose triton of the inhumans because the negative zone is kind of a is a, is a void that's like the ocean um and that made me sort of fall in love with superhero comics and uh for a long time i sort of like uh, devoured all the american comic books that i possibly could not just DC and Marvel, but uh, Dell, Ace, Gold Key, um, all of the, uh, the the smaller imprints that no longer exist. Um, so yeah, comics were comics were a very very big part of my life from a very early age. Well, it's funny how that like one storyline, like that negative zone story with uh, Fantastic Four, sticks in your memory. I know for me, it was like the whole arc of who is the Hobgoblin in um, you know Spider Man. Spider-Man was one of the things that really got me into long form storytelling because I just remember being on the edge of my seat, like who's, who's going to be the hobgoblin. Right. Yeah. And, um, um, so, and I first discovered your work. Uh, we had uh, an amazing comic shop in my hometown in Indiana, uh, 25th century five and dime. And it was in this basement and I would go every week to get, um, I was, you know, pretty religious about getting on the, on the Tuesday release of whenever the new Hellblazer was out, you know, I'd go down to 25th. So you got to write for Hellblazer, X-Men and 
you know, I'm I'm sure, you know, what what was the moment, the most pinch me moment where you were writing comics? Like that had to be pretty amazing. There's there's there's, there's two really. I mean, the the moment when um, Alisa Quitney called me up and asked me if I wanted to write a, a three part Lucifer story in Sandman continuity. That was amazing because I was a huge, huge Sandman fan. I, I, I thought then, and I still, still believe that you know, Sandman created a, a template, for extended stories, long form stories in comics that nobody had ever done before. A, a novelistic template, and Alan Moore was kind of uh, moving towards it in Swamp Thing, but I think it comes to its fruition in 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 Gaiman's work. And so, being able to to play in that sandbox, no pun intended was just just incredible i was so excited i forgot to be afraid of right. of, um, of following in neil's footsteps and then um some years later when um when nick Lowe called me up and asked me if i wanted to take a shot at the x-men um in my first first x-men arc i introduced a, a new a new um a villain group called the children of the vault and um about maybe six weeks after the first issue came out, someone sent me a link to a Wikipedia article um, on the children of the vault. It had become, you know, it had become canonical. Right. Um, and and that made it kind of real in, in a way it hadn't been before. Because I, I grew up reading those stories and, and then being able to tell stories, to, to add stories. It felt like, you know, uh, adding rooms to a house that I'd, that I'd in, uh, lived in as a child. It was just magical. Yeah, uh, friend of the podcast, uh, uh, Desmond Reddick, who uh, does a Canadian horror podcast called Dread Media, told me that he would have a hard time not asking you about 35 questions about your X-Men run. <laughs> he was, <laughs> he uh, specifically told me that it was one of his favorite runs for X-Men. And uh, I'm not uh, as huge of a comic reader. That, that's the thing. is, So I haven't read it. I've read your Hellblazer run because I loved horror comics, right? I wasn't a big mm -hmm. superhero guy, but I loved uh, Constantine because it was it felt like a horror comic. So I've always read, you know, that kind of stuff. But I do remember your Lucifer run because I was a Sandman guy as well. Right. Yep. So, and, uh, but Lucifer really took off too. So it kind of became your thing, right? Like you were most associated with it. Yeah, it did. It did, and um, yeah, it was it was very much a a game changer um, uh, for me, you know, career wise. I can remember meeting Karen Berger um, at a, um, a British Con, uh, UCAC, UKCAC, the UK Comic Art Convention. They used to have the the convention would run over a weekend. And on the Friday before it started, the Society for Strip Illustrators, which is a professional body for comic creators in the UK, would have a kind of pre-meet. And Karen came to that. And um, I can remember chatting to her and saying, you know, I was still waiting for the big break. And she said, there is no big break. What there is, if you're lucky, is an endless chain of little breaks that that, right. that, ev that eventually crests. Um, but Lucifer, you know, getting to write Lucifer felt like a big, big, big break. Um and it was it was a privilege to you know, uh, to work directly with Neil on it because he was script consultant, uh, creative consultant on all of those early Sandman Universe titles, and he was incredibly generous with his time. We'd have long uh, phone conversations about um, possible ways of taking the story and his take on the characters in the story. Yeah, um, it, and those types of things, like when you get those opportunities, it's just like how much you can learn from just conversations with writers like that it's just amazing. yeah really yeah. um very cool. he only ever he only ever said no to me twice there were two things that uh two 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 moments when he um when he sort of stepped in because because generally speaking he let me uh he let me have free reign but uh there was a point where i wanted to bring in bring in rose walker to tell a rose walker story and he asked me not to he said if he if he ever came back to sam and that was the story that he was going to pick up you know, the story of her um her pregnancy um and the other time was when i had lucifer talking to death i gave death a line of dialogue um lucifer says to her you have no claim on me and she says i wouldn't have anywhere to put you anyway and neil said she can't say that um she's not like the other endless she doesn't have a she doesn't have a realm you know there isn't a realm of death like the like the dreaming um 
so that it doesn't make any sense for her to say that. So I cut that out. And I can't remember any other time when uh, when 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 he said no. Right. Generally, generally speaking, he was sort of like uh, um, incredibly uh, incredibly accepting of the stuff that I was doing and really helpful with suggestions and just just full of um, you know just just very very supportive. When when we got the monthly approved, um, he said to me, "There are there are some things you can only learn by doing them. You know, you can't know from the outside what a weird mix of serendipity and of careful planning and serendipity a monthly comic book is. Um, so this will be good for you." And I said, "You you you can't tell me that anything in Sandman was serendipitous. Surely it was all planned from the start because the uh, the ending is present in the beginning." And he said, yeah, the ending is present in the beginning, but you wouldn't believe how many things just happened because they happened. And right. that turned out to be true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and so you got a lot of experience doing the long form storytelling through comics, but it was your Felix Castor books where you really <laughs> broke out and did prose. Is that the first time you attempted to do prose or, had you, or do you have a bunch of trunk novels? Um, so I spent I spent a lot of my twenties writing abortive novels, right? Writing failed novels, um, and they failed for a very good reason, which was that um, I did not know the first thing about story structure. My approach to writing a novel was write chapter one, have a cup of tea, come back, write chapter two, make another cup of tea, carry on until you get close to something that feels like an ending, and then write the end. Um, so I was writing these like big shapeless bags of story. Um, and I would send them up to publishers and they would send me rejection letters along the lines of, you should try writing this as a novel. Um, <laughs> Ouch. and it was, it was through, um, it was through writing comics that I kind of, um, I kind of came face to face with my failings, you know, on, on, on that score. Because if you, if you're, if you're writing a, a comic, um, a, a monthly comic or an episodic comic, you have a, a canvas that has a fixed size. You have a number of pages and you can't go above and you can't go below. So you have to, you have to plot out the beats. You have to, you have to become a miser and count the pages and make sure that you don't run out of pages before you run out of story. So it focuses you in on structure in a very visceral way. Um, and coming back out of that, uh, trying to write uh, novels again um, in my 40s, I guess it would have been. Um, I kind of knew how to use the freedom that a novel form gives you, you know, the, the fact that the canvas is infinitely stretchable. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I made a, be a better fist of it second time around. Well, and one of the things I would say too is that I feel like, and it's interesting <laughs> that it happened when you were writing under a pen name, but... <laughs> You know, the girl with all the gifts seems like another leap, and we'll get there eventually. But I do want to talk about Felix Castor a little bit. But um, I first noticed the Felix Castor books as I was living in Portland at the time, and I remember um, it was like an impulse checkout at the library because I it was in the new releases, the first Felix Castor book, and I saw my carry and instantly was like. Hey, Hellblazer. <laughs> He's, he was one of the Hellblazer writers. And oh yeah, he wrote Lucifer. And, oh yeah, I'm definitely getting that book. And remember just being blown away with the fact that you were able to find something really different to do with kind of the supernatural kind of detective thing or like exorcist thing because it's it's close to Constantine, but it, you know you you created this this different character and what i felt like maybe i'm wrong but it seemed like that was like a more comfortable place to write from when you're starting this new phase was you know trying to do like a new spin on on something similar to what you've done before yeah right? yeah very, very definitely uh, and, and i used hellblazer as kind of a way to get my foot into that door because right. um, it, it happened when I was when I was still working on Hellblazer, and I I, I sent a whole bunch of Hellblazers to Darren Nash, um, who was then in charge of uh, the Orbit list, and I said, you know, I, I could write some novels that were in that space that were kind of like that, but like a, a, different, a different take on that. And he was already 
uh, aware of Hellblazer. I was already a, a big comics fan, and uh, he commissioned three books, and in the end, I wrote five. Um, so yeah, it was um, very much in the same space as Hellblazer. I guess, I guess, in terms of style, it's it's borrowing um, in a fairly shameless way from Raymond Chandler. It's, it's a um, it's a noirish um, um, uh, idiom that, it, that that the books are written in. Yeah. Well, and then that's interesting too because with and you know you created a fan that by the time the girl with all the gifts came out. And again, it was, I'm a big library guy. So I'm at the library and I see MR Carey and I, I was like, well, I'm going to investigate because <laughs> it's not the exact same name, <laughs> but it has, and it had the sci-fi tag on it, which I know it's more horror, but it is kind of science, it is science fiction too. Yeah. It was in the sci-fi section. So I picked it up, looked at the, about the author. And as soon as I saw that it was you, you know, I was like, okay, sold. And I read The Girl with All the Gifts totally cold. I did not read what the plot was. I did not read anything. That's the best way to read it. Yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate authors that I trust, right? That I can go, because I did the same thing with Infinity Gate. I just, and listen, I'm a no bullshitter. Not every book works for me. And that's one of the, I've, I said that your Ramparts trilogy, and we can get into it, didn't work for me because of the prose style you were taking right. but one of the things that works or what i think is so amazing about your work especially post girl with all the gifts and this starts with girl with all the gifts is you take high concept massive swings and what i mean by that is that the girl with all the gifts if you go into a cold and you really get the the working of what the hell is going on the first 7,500 pages is such a delightful mystery. But then when you realize what it's about, it is absolutely a completely original idea to a tire genre. And that's what's so impressive about, you know, most of the work that you've been doing in the last couple of years, almost all of it, MR Carey, right? Is that, in fact, I say all the time that I think what makes mr carry distinct as a as a name is these massive high concept swings and i don't know how you feel about me saying that but that's what that's, i think distincts them and it's when very you kind to write girl with all the gifts was that the idea like i'm gonna i'm gonna really try to do like an original zombie thing because that's what it felt like to me so um it's very kind of you to say thank you um I, I I think a lot of things came together in Girl with All the Gifts, and there's a reason why it came out under that pseudonym. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll address that in a moment. Um, one of the things that had happened was that I'd been writing. I wrote two novels uh, as collaborations with my wife Linda and our daughter Louise. Um, City of Silk and Steel, which was published in the U.S. as Steel Seraglio, and um, House of War and Witness. So I'd spent two years, best part of two years co-writing with two women who had very strong voices of their own and with a collaboration um you you kind of have to find a style that works for all of you you have to sort of try and you have to triangulate on a voice that everybody everyone in the collaboration is um everyone in the team is comfortable with um and what that does i think is it sensitizes you to things to, to what your default choices are it makes you look more closely at things that you normally do without thinking about them at all and it um it kind of made me i came out on the other side of that more confident about experimenting with voice um so things like the yeah the fact that a girl with all the gifts is um is told in present tense and the fact that it's mostly consists of very short declarative sentences which was my attempt to convey the the vividness and immediacy of the way a child sees the world because you're coming out into the world with melanie She's lived in a room, a suite of rooms all her, all her life. And then suddenly she's out in the world. And I wanted I wanted the reader to get some of the impact of that. Um, the, the, the other thing that had happened Which, was... Um, by the way, is very challenging for struck for hardcore writers, right? To get it yeah. to. And, yes. And, which is funny because I remember my experience of reading it was that really challenged me as a reader. But... I was so invested in the story at that point. It, it really was an interesting give and go 
as a reader, right? Because you're, and I think the same thing happened with later, the Stephen King novel, where the character grows up as the first person narrative right. going on. It's very challenging. And I, my hat's off to you because <laughs> that is very hard to write, I'm sure. It you was, know? but 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 it, but it was also liberating, you know. After um, after after a, a sort of a period of acclimatizing, it it was um, it was a gift that kept on giving. Um, but the the other thing that had happened, and it's happened to me a few times since, is that I started out with a short story. Uh, there was a short story called Iphigenia and Alice, which I wrote for a um, uh, an anthology. Um, Charlene Harris and Tony Kellner used to do these themed anthologies every year. And the the um, the idea was they would come up with a really um, a really mundane everyday theme. Like one year it was family vacations, and another year it was uh, home improvements. And the idea the, the the brief was to write a horror or dark fantasy or supernatural story that that riffs on that theme. And the year that I said I would I would participate, the theme was school days. Um, and having said I'd do it, I spent a long time staring at the wall, just coming up with really, really bad riffs on Harry Potter. Um, and then I was in I was in Bergen. I was in Norway for the Raptus Comic Convention, and I was in a hotel room that didn't have any heating. The heating had failed. So I spent a lot of time when I wasn't on panels. I was cowering under three duvets in this in this bitterly cold hotel room. Um, and the idea came to me while I was there of a little girl sitting in a classroom writing the essay that every child writes again and again during their school days, what I want to be when I grow up. And it, it's Melanie, you know, she's, um, she has these, these fantasies, these, um, these ambitions, which are never going to be met because she's, she's trapped in this institutional space. And I, I, wrote, I wrote the short story, sent it in, and then I couldn't, I kind of couldn't put the character down, couldn't put the world down. So I carried on playing with it, um, and what came out at the other end of that was "Girl with All the Gifts." But I think that the 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 kind of the the impetus to keep experimenting came from those collaborations with Lynn and Louise, which is you know, and the the final thing that came out of it was was a book that just really didn't seem like anything we'd ever read before, and I think that's one of the reasons why it appealed to so many people is because you know, it became this kind of one of a kind apocalypse novel. And I want to get to Infinity Gate here pretty soon, but you had to, well, then, you know, the pen name M.R. Carey, this book that you write under a pen name suddenly takes off as this massive hit. And so you're kind of stuck with, with the pen name, right? Yep. Yes. And um, nobody's interested anymore in publishing Mike Carey. It's, uh, I, th I think, uh, but Mike, Mike suffers from the, the, the comparison. Um, what, what happened with the pen name was that um, I I gave the manuscript to my editor in the UK, um, who was Anne Clark at that time, and um, she really liked it. Um, but she thought it had the potential to appeal to a wider audience than the Caster, Caster books, which was what I was you know most associated with at that time. Um, so they decided. Um, as, a, as purely as a marketing thing to give me a, a, a transparent pseudonym so the buyers from the big chain um, bookstores and supermarkets looking at the book would not compare it with stuff I'd done before they'd just buy it they'd just order it order um, make their decisions for orders on the book's own merits which worked uh, which really worked so they just said we're gonna we're gonna do an ENM e &E banks on you we're, we'll just we'll just Publish, publish the book under your initials. So what's your middle name? My middle name is James. So MJ Carey. And the, the UK proofs went out under the name MJ Carey. On the day that they were released, um, somebody at Orbit made a horrifying discovery, which was there was already an MJ Carey on Goodreads and she writes bondage pornography. And she is, she is very prolific. Um, and we felt that the title, The Girl with All the Gifts, um, took on a whole different set of connotations <laughs> when you put it in that uh, in that other context. So uh, we switched very quickly to MR. And yeah, MR, I've been ever since. There's a, I can't avoid this Philip K. Dick story, but there was a, you know, he had that novel in the 60s, The Crack in Space, which happens to have a brothel in orbit. Right. Um, and uh, 
there's a really funny story about Terry Carr going down to Don Wolheim, who was the editor at Ace Books, you know, the first person to put science fiction on the cover of a book. And he said, Don, we can't call this book Crack in Space. And he was like, why? <laughs> and, he was, and, he, and Don Wolheim was like, I don't, I, what are you talking about? And he just turned around and left and it stayed Crack in Space. <laughs> um, but uh, it was, uh, it's kind of a funny Reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah. So she was a bondage, right? Well, you know, hey, now you're MR Carey, right? Yeah, now I'm MR Carey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so you've had several books under the name MR Carey. You did the sequel to The Girl with All the Gifts, um, A Boy on the Bridge, which was uh, really, really great. Um, and uh, Fellside, um, the Ramparts trilogy. And, I, and, and just so I'm clear on it, like, uh, you stuck to your guns on that with the prose, and that was the thing that I bounced off of with the ramparts. Okay, and and I admit that, and it's just because, and I totally respect what you did there, <laughs> right? Because you committed to like the concept, right? Yeah, and I super appreciate what you were doing there i just had a very hard time reading the kind of future dialect of it and i remember saying to somebody when i was reading it i said it's i can't i'm bouncing off of it but i so respect the commitment <laughs> <laughs> did, did you give up in the end did you have to give up i yeah it well i finished reading it but it was it was very it, the first part of it was very hard for me and okay. I, and i i respected like i said i'm a non-bullshitter so that, what i want people to know is that when i tell people and it sounds like hyperbole when i talk about the girls all the gifts or infinity gate i'm being dead honest i'm not just blowing smoke i love this stuff um and it, just as a reviewer i i you know i have to tell people my honest opinion I sure. super respect what you were doing with Ramparts. Um, I, I I get it, but for people who don't know, it takes it's kind of a post societal thing, and so you wrote the prose with this kind of post societal dialect, right? Yeah, at least that's yeah, and and um, and so it was so funny because I I so respected that you stuck to it. So the the the, the, the idea the idea there was you know having a narrator who is uh, barely literate who's come to uh, reading and writing quite late in life and is not good at it. Um, right. You know, he's particularly bad at irregular verbs. He uh, he he doesn't know how to handle them. I did, did some of the inspiration there came from Mark Twain. I I I, I was trying to do a kind of futuristic Huckleberry Finn. Right. You know, the, the, the wandering wanderings of a young boy in a in a weird dangerous world kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, like I said, I respect, I respected your, I don't think, I don't think if I tried, I could write, I could write a book like that. <laughs> Even if somebody was like paying me tons of money, I would have a hard time writing a book like that. Um, and, and, and so I totally respect your effort on it, but that's one of the things that I'm saying. I totally respect about what you do is the big swings, the big, huge swings. It, like, because I don't think a lot of writers could do anyways to infinity game because i mm -hmm. think this book is incredible <laughs> um with everything all everything everywhere all at once and spider verse and star trek doing multiverse and marvel doing all that doing a multi-dimensional story that come that is original or has something new to say that's a challenge in itself and but by creating the scope that you did with the pan dominion concept um I think that's what makes it so original or feel so different. Did you start with the concept and the world building or did you have a the character nugget like Melanie for Girl with All the Guests to start this story? I actually started with a map um, and I'm not proud of this because generally speaking, I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious of stories that have lots and lots of maps at the front. Um, I think more more often than not, it's a, it's kind of a vanity thing rather than anything that's essential to the story. But I I, I was watching um, a little YouTube um, documentary about um, the Schrodinger's cat paradox, 
and the idea of quantum entanglement. And it was uh, the, the presenter was talking about a new a new way of interpreting um, Schrodinger, the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, which is you know in the, in the classic form you have the cat in the box, and there's a, um, a a poison in the box that is either released or not released, and then until you open the box, the cat is both alive and dead, and then when you open the box, the the, the quantum wave collapses, and the cat is either alive or it's dead. But there's another way of looking at it, which some um, quantum scientists now um, espouse, which is when you open the box, you become entangled, you become quantum entangled with the cat and with the contents of the box. So from that moment on, there's a universe in which you open the box and the cat is alive. And there's another universe where you open the box and go, oh, poor kitty. And both of those things are true. The universe is split up into into two into two different states, and you're in both of them. Um, and this just blew my mind. You know, true or false, it, it felt like a really bold and fascinating idea. And I started trying to draw a, um, a visual representation of a multiverse based on that kind of endless fractal branching. Did not get very far with it, but um, what came out of that was the idea of the pandemonium, the idea of um, an empire that was founded in fractal space, uh, an empire in which there are a million worlds, but they're all variations on the same world. <clears throat> and um, then from that, I started to put the uh, put characters in the landscape, Hadiz and then Essien, Paz, um, Dulce. Um, so, so I started in a fairly abstract way um and then and then sort of fleshed out the story um bit by bit and it was hard actually it was one of the harder books to write that i've written you know girl with all the gifts came very fast uh, and there were only there was only one substantial draft of it and then minor revisions there were five drafts of infinity gate and they were structurally very different yeah i was talking to another <laughs> writer friend of mine about i was telling him about infinity gate and i was saying like what an insane challenge this book seemed like and how uh, the fact that you pulled it off seemed like an absolute magic trick to me as an outside observer because uh, I, like i said i went into it cold so i started reading it with i knew there was multiverse stuff from the tagline the cover uh but i didn't know anything so the first hundred pages i, I love a narrative um sleight of hand which is kind of what you do with the characters because it seems like it's one character and then it and i don't want to give away too much uh what happens to that character but you know this narrative sleight of hand is great now one of the things that makes infinity great the infinity gate um franchise potential like a dune or a game of thrones a tracker or, or, or any of those war franchises is that there's a vast and effective scope in the sense of the pandemonium you've created a galaxy because and here's the thing all your klingons your borgs or whatever you have in your version they're all they never have to leave earth right yeah and you can and so when <laughs> like the different uh villainous factions come in you get to do all those things you can have a a, a, a a universe as big in scope as the Federation and Romulans and Klingons, but they never have to leave Earth. It's genius. It's brilliant. So some, somebody called it on Goodreads a space opera that never goes, to, never bothers to go into space. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and uh, uh, I, I think that's so genius. I mean, like there had to be a point where you were where you realized, oh man, I could. I could really do lots of different things here and like the fact that within 500 or so pages you're able to introduce all these ideas that's part of the narrative of magic trick and i believe the bouncing from characters and the multiple point of views is one of the ways you had to do that right yeah yeah there's a, there's a point in the second book where one of the characters says that she feels like um the little blind spot in the center of a kaleidoscope that everything else keeps changing around her and she's the one fixed point. Um, and that's kind of what I was doing with the structure, you know, just constantly turning the kaleidoscope around so that characters move from the background into the foreground and the scope shift and the, the setting shift. And there's even, even more of that in book two. 
because in wow. book two you in book two you go into the insurrection, you meet the uh, the mother mass. Um, so it goes sort of beyond beyond the boundaries of the pandemonium into other parts of um, the 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 multiverse. Right, and what we do at, at this podcast is get under the hood of things. So I would hope at this point that people listening would have like trusted me and gone and gotten the book. But if you haven't might be a good time to pause go read infinity gate and come back because we might slip <laughs> let some things go um it's definitely one it, it, either one or two of my top reads of the year uh so and i don't That's say cool. that lightly uh um, thank you because it's been a great year for science fiction it really has been um and uh so anyways but in this book, you get to comment on climate change, socio-political effects of militarism, colonialism, artificial intelligence, quantum physics, multiple worlds theory, biological and technological creation of life and evolution. You got to do a lot here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all of them things that I'm uh, an enthusiastic amateur about rather than actually knowing anything very much. But yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, sorry, go. Yeah. With all that, like, I mean, you, that kind of all flowed naturally out of the process of you just started with story and these things kind of came up, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so did, there had to be a point where you were writing this where you were like, it had to feel a little bit like something that kept slipping out of your hands and you had to keep trying to catch it, right? Cause the, really? The, the, very much so. I mean, this, this is why it went through so many drafts. There was a, there was a point where... I showed it to Anna, my current editor, my current UK editor, when it was about, I was about maybe 45,000 words in. I just showed it showed it to her as a work in progress and said, you know, this is, this is what I'm doing. Is it okay? And she was very enthusiastic, but she wanted me to, she said, the structure is really weird. Um, the way you keep jumping around. Is there a way of doing it so that the, um, the characters are more, more kind of um, organically interwoven? And so I started trying to unpick the story um, so that Paz comes in earlier, so that Essien comes in earlier. Um, and it didn't work. It really didn't work. Uh, and the other thing that didn't work was um, there's a crucial thing that happens in Hadiza's art quite early on, which doesn't get resolved until the very end of the book. Um, and Anna wanted me to handle that in a different way. And the more I tried to to wrangle it into a more conventional shape, the more it dis disintegrated. And I reached a point, um, this would have been like early, early 2002. I reached a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, I, I had this, this book that had like exploded, um, and bro bro broken into fragments and I just put it aside. I thought, right, that's it. That's a, it's a failure. Um, and I started writing something completely different, um, which is, a um, kind of like a, a, a take on the Magnificent Seven or the Seven Samurai, if the Seven Samurai were undead monsters. Um, set in the Middle Ages in the UK, it's got ghosts and uh, zombies and uh, witches oh. and uh, bogeymen and so on. Um, and it was crazy fun and it was really quick. It, I wrote it in like three months and it was a, it was... It was restorative. I came out on the other side of that and I thought, okay, I can go back to Infinity Gate now and see what works and what doesn't work. You know, I'd got, I'd got enough of a distance from it. Um, I went back and I laboriously started putting it together again. Uh, and this time it clicked. It actually, it actually sort of um, held together. Yeah, uh, the structure really works well. One of the things is that it could be easy in a structure like this to be like uh, wondering where the characters went to, you know, because, yeah. but the thing is, is that the characters are so well written that you get hooked immediately into, you know, wherever the action shifts because characters like Aziz, Aziz is it? Adiz. Aziz? Adiz. Adiz. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and Paz, who, by the way, is as as a rabbit dad with five. Now we just got a fifth rabbit in our house yesterday. Cool. Uh, you know, having a, a main character rabbit doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, coming from a rabbit world, uh, a rabbit world, a rabbit earth, that's pretty cool. 
Um, but Hadiz also in that initial story, one of the things that's cool as as a serious dickhead here, you did the man in the high castle trick where everyone assumes that I think that this world that she's in is our world, right? And you know, a lot of people don't realize that the the world inside the novel Man in the High Castle has lots of differences. The Allies won, but they didn't win the same way as they did in our world. And I think one of the cool things that Phil did in that book was to, you know, immediately suggest like, hey, just because this is another, you know, it's not just one universe, two universes. And very quickly, Hadiz's story suggests to us. Uh, that there's a wider universe. And for me, as somebody who read it cold, you know, the, the way that is unfolded is excellent. Very well. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a lot, a lot of fun creating the characters. Um, you, you mentioned Paz uh, and, and uh, the, the cool thing about Paz is that she's very, very easy to underestimate. She, she, she comes across as like incredibly naive, incredibly trusting, and kind of helpless in this in the, in the face of this um this 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 gigantic sort of ungovernable um universe and then basically you know her, her strand is the story of somebody starting to come to terms with that and starting to um assert their own agency and to to you know to take control um at a point where it feels like it's impossible uh, for her to do that I think she's my favorite character of the of the, of the, uh, of oh, the three main great. protagonists. And one of the things that's cool about Paz being a rabbit, right? And and is that you know a lot of it's funny because some some books you read, you're like you see the movie in your mind right away. And one of the things I love about Infinity Gate is is I constantly was like they couldn't do this. <laughs> this, this. This is a book. This is a this. <laughs> Yes, they probably could do it as a movie or a TV show if they tried. But I I love that it lives as like kind of a prose monster, if you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. this, yeah. And but then again, I didn't really see how you how you were gonna do the girl with all the gifts and and you specifically did it by writing the screenplay, right? At so, the same time. At the same time yeah. as I was writing the novel, yeah. Yeah, that that really helped actually. So the the fact that I was bouncing between two different versions of the story. Wow. Yeah. And and how lucky were you to get Glenn Close and all that? So, I still like, can't believe I still can't believe it. When, yeah. when 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 Cammy, the producer, phoned me and said Glenn said yes. <laughs> yeah. Glenn Close is going to speak my lines. My God. That was awesome. But back to Infinity Gate. So um, yeah. So Paz and these alternative evolutions give the book a surreal quality that make it like you know very different like how much fun did you have doing the surreal stuff and, and did you dial that back or did you just go full bore on it no I, 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 I leaned into it i mean it, it's um it's not just paz it's uh, moon, moon sustenti as well the uh, the yeah. cat warrior yeah. who gets to come much more into the into the fore in the second book um yeah, you know, the, uh, the 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 idea of these these alternate lines of evolution and the societies that they would produce, and the kind of the kind of mistrust. There's 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 a, there's a version of um, uh, what's the the Disney movie Zootropolis? You know, the the the, the, the sort of Zootopia, yeah. the uh, the the natural mistrust between carnivores and and herbivores, and the tendency of carnivores to think of herbivore cultures as inferior. Um, so that there's a the the the, the the relationship between Paz and Moon um, is is problematic from the start and continues to be so through the second book. But eventually, they uh, they kind of come to an understanding with each other. Um, so I, I loved I loved all that. I loved the fact that you know the the the, the way the story um, plays out allows me to to sort of mess around with infinite variations on those things. Um, it's only it's only a duology that the two novels sort of wrap up as a as a story. Uh, it's not open ended at all. But I'm currently working on a novel which is set against the backdrop of the Pandemonium. So it's kind of like um, a fable of the Pandemonium or a legend oh. of the Pandemonium um, because it is a it's a really nice canvas to, uh, to 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 have to have to play with. Well, certainly, I think you could do a hundred thousand stories in the <laughs> I should live so long. Yeah. 
Yeah. We, we... Maybe, maybe three or four. <laughs> well, but, you know, I'm sure when Gene Rodberry created Star Trek, he didn't realize how many stories were going to come out of that, right? Yeah. So, and right now, this is this is your canvas, so, but I, I, my... My thinking on this is that that scope of of the universe that you've created, uh, you know, I think is as long as your imagination is firing, I'm sure ideas are gonna are gonna pop up here and there in the future. I hope so. I hope so. And let's let's hope the readers like uh, discover or you know want as many as I do. Right. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, now there's a quote um, and I was going to read uh, but the Pan Dominion wasn't made overnight and didn't come without a cost. The first few parallel worlds learned how to step wounded and wasted each other in endless unwinnable wars. Wars that were nothing but onslaught since stepping made every square foot of ground a battlefront until they finally came to see that infinity made war obsolete. You must have really thought out that history, right? They had to, right? Yep. So see yep. their stories right there, <laughs> right? In in, um, uh, in in book two, we meet um, we meet Spearhead Division, which is the uh, the branch of the cello that does um, uh, kind of first contact, that goes out and discovers. I mean, they're specifically looking for potential threats to the Pandominion, to not not so much for worlds to uh, worlds to conquer as worlds that might actually be too dangerous to uh, to go to go near to approach. Um, and there, there, it was Spearhead that discovered the mother mass, you know, this sentient planet. So all of that sort of, uh, all of that history comes back in, in the second book. Yeah. And the mother mass, by the way, uh, you know, it's, it's awesome <laughs> because, and I don't mean this to be reductive because I mean this as an absolute compliment, but it's like your board, right? <laughs> <You laughs> yes. Yeah. And, because I love what a science fiction universe you could say, oh, that's kind of their Klingons or that's their Romulans or whatever, you know, because I think I love the power chords of space opera, right? Because there's certain too. elements that are the power chords. And if you play a power chord really well, you've got a great backbeat. And what I love about the Mother Mass, for example, is like they're immediately understandable as a villain as an antagonist you get it right away as soon as they're introduced you see all their potential and as a person who likes their imagination stoked by a book i like when a book makes me start thinking like oh you could do this you could do that there's this great thing and the mother mass was a moment where my mind just started firing and i was like oh. ready i was ready for you to, to to go there and so then when the insurrection is brought in i'm like yep yeah we're we're there we got it you know we got the, the stuff i wanted and so and and one of the things that makes me feel really good about that as a reader is that um that's one of those moments where you're like yeah i'm in great hands like this is this is telling me a story that i feel really good about because it's doing both big swings that i couldn't see coming and things that just make perfect sense and are just great just chef's kiss and Thank that, you. I, I think the mother <laughs> chef's kiss now where did that come into the process how early was that part of the um you said that 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 map that i did right at the outset um it was a map um the, the the center of it was a kind of a kind of enfolding spiral um in different colors and that was meant to represent the um the kind of the the opening of a sort of fractal flower of, of different universes right. and then there were four there were four blocks that were outside it um, so like four um, rectangular spaces um, at the four corners of the map, and one of them was um, one of them was the mother mass. One of them was a, a kind of um, an orbital civilization that that uh, that, that moved between the, um, the 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 sort of outer planets of the, of the different solar systems. Um, and I can't remember now what the other two were, but the 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 the, the, the mother mass was. Oh, one of them was the scour. One of them was the uh, the scour worlds, the empty worlds. So the mother mass was in there from the start, but I didn't decide um, from the start that that it would become a character. That that happened in a in a more organic way as the story, as I was telling the story. The mother mass is much more uh, present in the second book. Now, did you keep the map 
visible when you were writing? Yeah, or, I went and yeah. I went and looked at it every every now and again just for inspiration's sake. And I I don't know where it is now. I do this stupid thing, which is um, if I have loose sheets of paper, I slip them into into the front of books, usually uh, like um, graphic novels. And I've got hundreds and hundreds of graphic novels, so the map is there somewhere, but uh, I can't immediately put my hand on it. Yeah, I did a map for a science fiction novel I co-wrote with a friend, a flesh trade, where we had like this kind of new Bangkok type like fucked up city on another planet and it was funny because i knew the map was only just for us but i had made a copy for ed and then when i was writing like the, having the geography of it right there was was really helpful i yeah. didn't really feel like anybody needed to see it and i think with what you're doing like that map is something it sounds like something that you would need <laughs> right yeah. to keep everything straight but it's all very clear in the book. It works really, really well. And Thank it's you. funny because I'll admit, my when I was like about halfway through this book, I was like, oh, this shit's going to get confusing. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to get really confusing. And um, it didn't. It was, it was all very clear. And um, I, uh, I remember I read the last hundred pages. I was... I was I was uh, on the train uh, on the trolley here, like uh, in San Diego, going to the SDSU library, and I almost missed my stop because the the, <laughs> the ending was, was so good. I almost ended up on the trolley for much longer than I needed to be, uh, and I remember thinking on that last like holy shit it all works it all came together because i really thought it was going to be much more confusing than it was it, it kind of narrows to a point doesn't it? it it starts out in a lot of different places but it's a convergence the structure is a convergence yeah and uh, so are we gonna um so last thing on infinity gate and i'm gonna try to wrap up here uh uh, you've given me a lot of your time, and I I, I really appreciate this. With, yes, pleasure. With the second book, you you've already finished the second book. You have started this this kind of fable, so you got a a third adjacent story yep. for Infinity Gate. Okay, cool. And uh, our our Seven Samurai uh, Middle Ages book is that coming? Uh, that's coming. So so next year, um, in I think maybe May or June, um, Echo of Worlds, which is the second Pan Panaminian novel. Uh, and then nothing for the rest of 2024. In 2025, I will tell you seven, which is this um, uh, this weird um, kind of supernatural story. And then maybe late 2025, um, Dog Bitch Bess, which is this, um, the, the, uh, the fable. Okay, and so... Again, what's the title of the second Infinity Gate? Echo of Worlds. Echo of Worlds. All right. Well, I, I'm very excited for that one. Uh, uh, I would personally, I mean, Girl with All the Gifts is a pretty impressive piece of horror sci-fi fiction crossover. But I would feel like you got to be pretty proud of this one, right? I, I am. I really am. Yeah. really really happy with how it came together because it was a it was a hard hard journey yeah and yeah because i mean and when, when i talk about taking daring swings like this this had to feel like you know not to stretch the baseball metaphor too far but it had to feel like closing your eyes and swinging right <laughs> <laughs> yeah if it, it it actually felt like i was trying to do a jigsaw in the dark at times Right. It, it, well, Dif different metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it really, really, really worked. Um, so I think if, uh, as far as like, so you, you said this is closed, two books. It's not a trilogy then. Okay. Nope. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, so we, we've got a handle on where you're going with all this. So we have a closed ending for Infinity Gate. Yes. Like for this story. Got it. But then probably returning, well, certainly returning to the Pandominion as an idea in, in other books. Okay. But these characters and this particular storyline has, has, has a clear end, which I yeah, think is. That, that yeah. wraps up. 
yeah, that's important because I think with a story like this, it can be easily like yeah, go everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Know? And, there, there, uh, there were some, some 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 reviewers were not happy with the cliffhanger ending of Infinity Gate. They 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 uh, they felt uh, they felt that it was a little bit of a uh, false prospectus. But uh, I did I didn't want to I didn't want to like um, end it on a false resolution. I wanted to sort of um, you know to 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 end it on here here they are the team has come together and this is the the, the crisis they're now facing and that's the story of the second book. Well, I. I think it's a perfect ending for what's introduced at the beginning, and you know, kind of the reveal at, at, at the end. It's funny too, because I definitely had the thought of when I was reading the last dwindling pages, like, Whoa, this is going to end really soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm really then, suddenly. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I was, I was pleased with, uh, where it went. Um, uh, Mike, I don't say this lightly. Uh, this is a masterpiece of science fiction. And Thank you. it is Thank you, hard David. in 2023 when we are coming up on the 100th centennial of science fiction as a genre with a name. We know science fiction has existed longer than 100 years. But as a genre with a name, it is hard to come up with truly original science fiction. And what I the thing I struggle with when I'm trying to rank my favorite reads of the year is uh, The Mountain and the Sea, R Ray Naylor this is your competition for the top spot <laughs> that book uh, really changed how I viewed the world and that's okay. like a, a I have huge, to read it yeah it, it was hugely influential in that way but I've read Solaris and I've read things that were similar to it and what really got me with infinity gate was doing a multiverse story where i feel like i've never seen anything like this before that i've that in a hundred years of science fiction you've done something original Thank like you. that's a freaking magic trick sir <laughs> that is a magic trick and uh i just i half the reason i wanted to have you on the podcast was just to tell you with my mouth words how much i love this book <laughs> That is very it's cool. It's a lovely thing it. to hear. It's one thing to type it, but it's another thing to say, like, holy shit, I loved this book. And I did love Infinity Gate. So I hope everyone gets out there and gets it. Is there other work of yours that you feel has been missed that you want to put a plug out for, whether it's the comics or whether it's some of the older books? Well, there's a there's a new Felix Caster story that came out this year, um, The Ghost in Bone, which was a, a novella that I did for Subterranean, and it was uh, it was really fun to to go back into that world. Um, I did not know about this. See, <clears throat> like I needed to know this. It is yeah. a limited edition hardcover. It's um, it follows on um, a couple of years after the end of um, uh, Naming of the Beasts, and uh, it. it moves forward the sort of big arc story of why are the dead rising what was the great project um in hell in hell um i'd, I'd love to plug the two novels that i wrote with lou and lynn um city of silk and steel and steel Surrey and and um, house of war and witness um house of and world witness house of war and witness um it's a, his, a historical ghost story i have not read those the and they sound awesome and i I admit I did not know of those. Now I, I, they will be on my list, sir. So. Oh, and and also there's a comic I wrote a long, long time ago um, called My Faith in Frankie. It was a four issue miniseries, and it's the only time I've ever attempted comedy, specifically romantic comedy, and I had great fun with it. Um, the art was by Sonny Liu and Mark Hempel, and it's a gorgeous book. Um, and there was a there was like a, a soft cover collection of it a little while ago. Um, which you can probably pick up on eBay for a couple of couple of dollars, and I, I, I think it's it's one of the things I'm most proud of. Well, sir, I appreciate your time and coming on postcards from Dying World. You're welcome anytime. Um, I'm Thank sure you. when you write this sequel, I'll be ringing you up, uh, or when the sequel comes out, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I just love getting under the hood with writers and i i 
I love hearing about your process because uh, I, I definitely, when I was reading this book, thought, what the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he, is, he is working on another level uh, because I just was so impressed by, by what you were able to pull off. Of this book. Thank you, David. It's been a great pleasure talking. Yeah, and so folks, if you haven't um, read all the MR Carey, definitely do that. Um, I have I imagine if you got to this point, you read Infinity Gate. I've been singing the praises for it, but uh, the whole back catalog is pretty amazing. And uh, I uh, just really uh, love Mike's work. So I appreciate that. I'm just excited to know there's more Felix Caster. I did not know that. So uh, Subterranean, I'm on yep. it. Uh, and folks, uh, thanks for listening. And um, just remember uh, StokerCon uh, coming up this year in San Diego. We'll be doing all kinds of events here in San Diego to promote StokerCon coming. So we can pregame. We're going to have monthly events leading up to it. And uh, the World Horror Writers Convention here in San Diego. It's a great reason to come here and visit us. Um, and we'll see folks also at the PKD Festival in Colorado next summer. So thank you everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time.